Welcome everybody to the session about collaborative leadership for health and well-being, how to rise to the challenge, organized by uh, the Scanner Network, which is a collaboration between uh, Karim Stiftung, Ruber Bosch uh, Stiftung, uh, and the Health Foundation in UK. So this is a part of the Salzburg Global Seminars. What we have worked with here at, um, at the Skiana, I'm a co-chair of this, uh, of the fourth cohort of the Skiana, is collab collabor collabor collaborative leadership for health and well-being, of course. And why does it come in? This is very an, an, a very important question in times of change. We all agree on that things are not the same. It's not just because of COVID, but it's also because of COVID. We are moving very fast technologically wise, and that has moved us faster with COVID. We are having a challenge with how can we think holistically and traditionalistically at the same time? How can we move from being very isolated in silos to working together? How do we grasp the complexity and work cross jurisdiction, cross disciplines, and also outside of the normal clinical health settings. It's also very much about a demand for more, but with the same resources, or maybe even less. But it's also about how can we, with leadership, both help people who work, so be kind, with people who work in the, in the health settings, but also so we can take care of also the weakest in our societies, leaving no one behind, to use leadership also guided by the SDGs, to work with health and all policies, and be a part of moving forward to, to a post-COVID world that is better for you as leaders, for the ones that you lead, and for the health in society. So this is very much about societal and technological readiness, about literacy, and very much about collaboration and compassion in leadership. So with, with me here today, I have uh, Francesca Colombo, so head of health division at OECD, uh, Nick Davison, head of wellbeing at the John Lewis Partnership UK, Richard Kirby, chief executive of the Birmingham Community Healthcare uh, NHS Foundation, uh, Sari Hughes, chief executive of Center of Mental Health in the United Kingdom, and Judith Safford, patient expert and advocate at Rumakura Foundation. So welcome to them. And what we are going to do uh, after, after a, a short introduction here is, is to go into some uh, questions on for you audience uh, on, on leadership, where you, where you define leadership. And just a little bit about uh, the Skiana network. So this is a network which, which was established by these three mentioned before mentioned uh, uh, foundations in order to strengthen leadership uh, going forward, but also between, in this case, three countries, maybe it should be more in the future, but working together both in countries and across countries and with different kinds of leadership, so people in different positions in this part. And and we will have three of these Skiana members giving a three minutes uh, explanation on, on how they have worked with this challenge, this leadership challenge, and can enlighten us a bit into that part. So with uh, no further delay on, on my talking here, so let's go into the very, very exciting pizza. It might feed your curiosity, but not your stomach. So let's get to it you can join it on slido as you can see there or or also use the scanning device there and what we ask you about here is to choose the three that you think are most important so compassionate leadership visionary comfortable with uncertainty inclusive and democratic silo buster emotional intelligence engaged listener and self-aware So and if we if we then think a little bit 
I mean, you should vote while I'm talking. What, what is it? What is it that we really need going forward? If we agree on, as, as many of us do, that we really need to step up in health, we really need to have a, if not a new paradigm, a new way of working. What is it we need if it's different from what we needed in the past? And with the new technology that we can use to help us, but that we also need to grasp with, because we also hear a lot of fatigue of technology, a lot of confusion with complexity of technology. So how do we get these things in and what, what are the main traits of leadership that we really need in order to, to get these things in? So um, hopefully we, we are getting some results in that we can also use to, to look at here. So, um, okay, emotional intelligence as very high, inclusive and democratic, comfortable with the uncertainty. I, I, so I'm a futurist, so I think that is definitely very important. Mm. So inclusive and uh, yeah, Self-aware is at the bottom. Inclusive and democratic and emotional intelligence looks like equal top scorers in this. That's quite interesting. And they're even going further on this one. And, and just to be clear, we are not expecting that you don't think the others are, are important. It's just the three most important on this part. So, my, my favorite, I must say, is engaged listener. Um, but I can see that's quite low on the list, but we can take a discussion on that uh, later. But I'm not disagreeing with, with that they're all very important, also the ones that we see on the top. So, Let's, uh, let's move on in the program. Thank you very much for, uh, for, the, for um, voting and being a part of, of this part. And uh, with, with this, um, I think we are ready to move on to, uh, to the next part, which, which is the lightning talk from, from uh, one of each of the three Skiana challenge groups that we have. So they have three minutes each. And after each one, I will ask the two other ones to, to give a reflection of no more than one minute. And I will be a very strict timekeeper. So that's why you can see that they're just ready to go ahead. So Richard, please, would you take the floor? Thank you very much for the um, introduction. And, and it's good to talk to you all from um, a, a slightly rainy uh, Birmingham in the United Kingdom um, this afternoon. Um, the group that I was part of were interested in looking at how healthcare organisations can improve the care we provide to our patients by improving the health and well-being of our colleagues, of the staff who work with us in our teams. And in that context, we were particularly interested in the idea of compassionate leadership, which I noticed didn't quite make it to the top um, three of the pizza, but maybe I will be able to persuade you to change your your minds. Um, we looked at a number of examples from different sectors and um, different countries. So we had a look at how John Lewis as a private sector organisation in the UK owned by its colleagues works. And we'll hear a bit from um, Nick later. We looked at the idea of compassionate leadership as developed by Professor Michael West and, and, and his body of work. And we're really privileged to have a chance to talk directly to him. And we looked at the idea of self-led health and care teams as, as pioneered by the Bulletsog um, organisation and, and increasingly spread um, uh, you know, across a range of places. And I think it's clear to us from all of that, that this idea of compassionate leadership, of looking after our colleagues so they can look after our patients is really important. And that healthcare organisations who engage and empower and just care for our colleagues will provide better care to our patients and I think it's increasingly hard in the world I think we're 
in to see how we can provide good care if we don't also care for our colleagues. And if we needed to be taught that lesson, the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, has taught it us um, really, really clearly. And, and to take just a couple of quick examples from my own organisation providing community health services to the city of Birmingham, about um, a million people in, in the centre of the UK. We relied on hundreds of teams to make small innovations to respond to the pressures they found themselves in. So whether it was using technology differently, whether it was changing the way they cared for patients, whether it was changing the way they worked with, with colleagues in other organisations, we just couldn't do it all centrally. We had to rely on them to make their their own changes and centrally we put our effort into making sure that they were well cared for whether that's um, protective equipment whether it's vaccinations whether it's testing whether it's counseling um, and we just could not have got through what we've been through if we hadn't given our teams the freedom to do what they knew was right and to support them um, by looking after them rather than instructing them um, or seeking to, to direct them. So we think this is really important. We think there's lots more to explore. We don't think we've got um, to the bottom of it. And I hope the discussion we're going on to have will help add further to those ideas. But it seems to us that compassionate, empowered leadership is at the heart of what we need to do going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Three minutes on the second. Impressive. So, uh, Sarah, your thoughts on, on this part? I mean, I think compassionate leadership is a fundamental principle, isn't it? We can't underestimate the power of being a, a gentle, open, kind leader. But I think we also need to remember that compassion is a privilege too. So, you know, effectively to be a compassionate leader, you have to have the organizational conditions to enable that to thrive. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Judith? I think it's interesting if you turn the idea around and think, what would it be without compassion? I mean, we know compassion starts with oneself and then it starts with the people that are close to you, like your work colleagues. And then when that framework is there, then you can take it out to the people you're caring for. And I'm a patient representative, so I'm interested in what happens at the end of the line and see that without compassion within the teams, I think it would be very difficult to be compassionate towards patients. Thank you. And now if we can uh, ask uh, Judith to take the floor for her three minutes. Thank you. So I'm joining from Switzerland today and thrilled to be here. As I mentioned, I'm a patient with autoimmune con conditions, a cancer survivor, and our Sienna group has been looking at leadership that has su supported the empowerment of citizens for health and well-being. And our approach has been to find such organizations and study them, ones that started very small, one person or, or a small organization grew and went to scale. And we've interviewed 11 such leaders from well-known organizations like Patients Like Me, Patients Know Best, but also grassroots movements uh, in Africa, Australia. And we profiled these leaders using the Harvard Systems Leadership Model profiling them around the biography, the leadership qualities, the community that they were serving and the system that they work in. And our work is ongoing, but here's a few first thoughts. Firstly, these leaders all had something in common. They were patients, they were close relatives of patients, or they somehow could identify with patients and knew what it was like to be an outsider without a voice. The woman in corporate finance whose child was ill with sickle cell disease and started an advocacy movement for better care. A Harvard professor who traces his engagement for the underserved back to his family's experience as German Jewish migrants. And he's working now to get, help patients get access to their reports. Secondly, all these leaders were well established in their own fields. They were health professionals, they were academics, they were corporate people, they were campaigners, and they used those established networks and skills very effectively for their, for their empowerment work. Thirdly, there must be thousands of such movements, and it is surprising how few have actually gone to scale. And finally, these leaders apply and live collaborative leadership. They are flexible and bring together multifaceted 
multifaceted approach, approaches. They are listeners and cooperative and bring diverse stakeholders together for a, for a joint vision. And they understand about ambivalence and uncertainty, how to be disruptive and yet supportive, how to tackle power inequalities with collaborative work. So in short, a tentative conclusion is that leaders who empower citizens for empowerment understand the complexity of the system and navigate it with collaborative leadership. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard, would you give your minute on thoughts on this? Yes, thank you. I mean, thank you, Judith, because there are some wonderfully moving stories of individual leaders in there. And I think that perhaps the, the, the really interesting next question for me is how to build, if you like, collaborative leadership at the other end so that when folks like that try to engage with large organisations providing services, they're met with open arms and they're met with people who see that they can add value and be partners and um, help in a common cause, which, which is often not the experience, I think. Um, mm at the moment. So I, I think that's the kind of next really interesting question. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sarah? Yes, thank you, Judith. I always like listening to you when you're talking about this um, space. I think there is something really important here about leaders also telling their story. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it takes often quite a lot of courage or bravery, however you want to say, you know, insight, um, ability to reflect, to be able to kind of tap into some of that. So. Um, and that's not a natural kind of um, resource that people have, which is why I'm not surprised that emotional intelligence is so high on, on people's list of things that are important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. So let's let's take the last one of your of your tree, Sarah. Can you? Take the floor, please. Yes, absolutely. So um, our challenge group were really looking at the role of social movements, really thinking about how do we how do we work with social movements? How do we kind of adopt some of the social movement way of doing things that that seems to achieve change in many respects, as we heard from Judith? So we were very much motivated by the anti-vax movement and our concerns about climate change. And we spoke to people who are operating currently within social movements, those people from Be More Pirate, Extinction Rebellion, um, health campaigns like Equally Well. And we know that health has adopted a social movement approach for quite some time. So we see um, the use of value-based conversations, collective action towards improvement, sustaining change through collective action. So, you know, we know that this sort of language, this way of thinking that the value on, placed on co-production is already a part of our system it may not be in a meaningful way in the way that we'd like, but it is there. But we also know that there's quite a lot of anxiety about social movements, especially the anti-vax movement right now. So with all of that said, we also found that social movements do provide opportunities for diverse voices. They do promote innovation. They also provide independent accountability of the health system. So, you know, they hold a mirror up. And perhaps that it's not about turning health systems into social movements, but there is a significant and moral and ethical reasons why we, we shouldn't. Um, we don't want to colonize social movements. We've got to remember that social movements and the idea of bureaucratic health systems as they are, are not natural bedfellows. So what does that mean? So we effectively, our emerging ideas are about creating uh, health systems that are really open to meaningful engagement, that systems that can adopt movement ideals like the principles around co-production, this values-based practice, these you know, um, permeable organizational boundaries which allow uh, fluid and open, transparent conversations. And of course, we do see it being done. Judith has given us examples and there are so many more. Gastein is a, a, a very good example about relationships with the, with the youth board. So, so in order to put all of that together, there is another but, and the but is to really create organizational cultures that really meaningfully engage with uh, local, regional, national systems. We do have to tackle the true nature of leadership. 
the true nature of what compassionate and collaborative approaches mean and be really realistic about, you know, the power struggles, the barriers that we all face to operating in those ways, in that way, and, and really uncover um, some of the tools that we all need to, to embed and, and but face the truth of the difficulty of it first. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Judith? I believe that, that particularly in the health system, health workers and people involved do want to, to listen and to see these changes. But I think that partly we're sort of stuck in, in established systems and it's very hard to break out of it. And that, that you can't, you can't really change things until you have the resources and the time to kind of start adopting new ideas and being open to those new ideas. And we're just holding on because if we don't hold on, everything's going to fall apart sort of feeling. And that, that's mm -hmm. my impression that there's a lot of goodwill throughout the system at different levels, but somehow it's got to be supported that it happens. Hmm. Yes. Richard? Thank you. Um... Thank you, Sarah. And perhaps building a bit on Judy's point, and as someone who leads an organisation, the idea of turning organisations into social movements is a bit scary, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, it seems to me, though, that there's something about open leadership that's really important in here and being, you know, you know kind of being open about what, what we, the leadership team, know, sharing the information, being open to hearing what's being said to us it, it is, a, I, I think, an important idea for me for what you're, what you're saying. So thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, all three, both for your um, uh, for your story, for your um, description of what you have worked on and on, on your comments. And I think it's it's uh, if I just take the three, uh, three of the uh, main points from each of you, I mean, freedom, freedom to to do what is right and with the support, uh, which was was one part and and um, from from Richard and, and then uh, Judith on on this connection with and the understanding uh, and compassion with the with the patient being a patient or being connecting with uh, with the patients and 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 then seeing the social movement as accountability is is actually quite uh, quite a good way to say this so I mean you could also say this is the consciousness consciousness on on getting the bureaucracy not to go totally rigid uh, in it so so very very good uh, points here. So now I would uh, also ask the audience to send in any comments, questions, reactions in the chat so we can also take that. Uh, but also um, ask uh, Nick and Francesca if, um, if they have any reflections on these three ones, three first ones. So Francesca. Uh, maybe, maybe Boggy, more than uh, reflections, uh, also question because Everything that's been said make a lot of sense. Obviously, the open leadership, uh, the compassionate leadership, uh, the flexibility that is required. But my question is perhaps a little bit provocative. We do have health systems that tend to be quite rigid in many ways, including in the way roles of different health professionals are organized, in, in the way in which leadership structure uh, are set, uh, in the way incentives schemes, uh, you know, payments, uh, uh, mechanism, uh, and even the flows of information is quite hierarchical and sex. And so how do we, you know, in a way change, uh, you know, that more to a different model, a more, you know, open leadership, a more listening leadership, particularly, how do we do that in time of crisis, and mm -hmm. which there is a tendency perhaps to go back to, you know, the systems that one have rather than trying to to challenge the system than, um, than, than we have. And it's more, you know, it's, it's a question, how do we do that change uh, towards, you know, the models of leadership that would be better suited for, for the future? So, so I guess if I say, try to say it in, in, uh, in my understanding on, on visualization, it's do you go upwards on the S-curve or do you go downwards with the challenge? So do you go back? To the comfort zone or or do we define the new comfort zone and and take the discomfort in in that time okay who wants to um, take the first response yes Sarah 
Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And, and there's something, isn't there, about uh, we have a, a leadership professor in this country called Keith Grint who says that, you know, wicked problems require wicked solutions. And one of the one of those wicked solutions is very much the ruthless pursuit of meaningful co-production. And so, you know, that that part of that approach is that you you bring people in and by doing that in a meaningful way we fundamentally together tear down those boundaries and it you know it comes to you know real systemic you know um logistical practical levers to also philosophical conversations around power and um you know priorities and the where I've seen that happen in a meaningful way is where I've seen the bureaucracy um not disappear but certainly reduce significantly but it does demand a ruthless pursuit first it's, it's... richard judith any uh, response from your side i mean perhaps two two quick thoughts so so it is possible i think to change organizations and we've we've talked to some folks and, and listened to some people who have but i think it's really hard i guess my observation on on the pandemic um, is I think in, in my own organisation, it's accelerated our change towards a more decentralised, um, more compassionate, um, you know, may, maybe less rigid approach, because it's been the only way we can cope with what's been um, thrown at us and support our staff to, to, to rise to the challenge, you know, which they've done fantastically. So I, I think that the COVID has been a catalyst for the change rather than an obstacle in, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Judith? It's always not nice if you have a really concrete example, and the one I'm thinking of is the recent decision in the UK to introduce, propose that one engages in a system of patient director. It's in the new NICE uh, guidelines mm -hmm. for shared decision making, and the idea that instead of having a, a sort of a, a clinical director and a business director, you have a tripod with a patient director that can really begin to institutionalize and if they work, of course, collaboratively, uh, begin to bring in new ideas and, and change the system top down the way the way it works, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Nick, questions from you? Uh, yeah, I think in terms of my reflections, I think, um, firstly, having heard all three uh, presentations, you know, very different, all three of them, uh, all with merit. And it shows you that there isn't one size that fits all for any of this. And actually, you could you could adopt all three in different settings. So I think it depends where you sit. Um, if I come back to Richard's originally, I think, you know, the whole uh, aspect of compassion in a care industry, um, you know, sits very comfortably for me. And why wouldn't you look after, you know, care for the carers? And actually, from an operational perspective, you know, that's a kind of criticality of having enough clinicians, doctors, nurses, specialists available to actually help other people. So if you don't help them, you know, you're constrained in terms of your resources. I think Judith um, described very eloquently the fact that actually you need to understand your audience and actually the audiences and the settings for where healthcare is delivered differs depending on, you know, the context. And I think um, I think also very much that you can't do deliver this on your own. So the the whole nature of collaboration is actually getting more from a partnership or relationship with somebody else that gives you either pace or capability or speed that you wouldn't get if you were doing it on your own. And I think Sarah, um, I'm I'm really taken with the whole kind of social movements and being a bit kind of challenging to the status quo. So I, I kind of, it's, I've always wanted to be a pirate, I guess, but, but um, that kind of appeals to me, but there is something around, it is difficult um, and it may be temporary, but but actually you can get real traction really quick, um, providing you, you're certain of the ground and the boundaries you want to place around it, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, let's uh, take a question from the audience and just uh, to remind you, you can use the Q&A tab but you can also share your thoughts in the chat uh, or uh, and and post a public comment if you share it with everyone uh, in the chat so um a question here is uh, how can we accelerate the adoption of new forms of leadership within a static bureaucratic organization so richard you 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 were fearful of of the social movement so <laughs> Well, I think um, I, I think part of the answer lies in what Judith and Sarah have been been saying. Actually, the the, the closer I think organisations get to the patients we are caring for, 
um, the more these kinds of approaches become necessary. And I think the more we listen to a you know, wide range of ideas from different places, the, the easier it becomes. Um, but, it, but it's hard. I mean, in my own, my own organization, we are running a development program for all our line managers that talks to them about this stuff and is asking them to invest days of their time in, in understanding it. And I think this kind of change only, only comes slowly, I think. I mean, maybe I'm not very good at pulling it off fast, but I think it, it, it comes slowly. And as a couple of the other um, questioners have asked, I think it, it, you know, there are still examples across healthcare and we've had our high profile ones in the UK of, of, of cases where this hasn't worked and where organisations have got the culture badly wrong and, and patients have suffered as a result. But I, I think Judith and Sarah have the, have the kind of answer if we can build more of what they're talking about into the way we work. So I, I, I assume that uh, Judith and Sarah would need to respond to this. Well, um, in some some level, it's been said now. Um, if we move on to the next step to think about how this could actually be implemented, I think we need to recognize that there's a tremendous will. I mean, patients want to improve the system. Why wouldn't they? Uh, but they also need support, and you would you would you know you would need to have training programs to help those two communities of on the healthcare side and the patients to learn how the system works and support things. I mean, that would be the next step. Mm -hmm. Sarah, do you have any additional points? Yes, I mean, I go back to my original, one of my original points, which is about the organisational system caring for people within it. And so, you know, in order to be compassionate, you have to feel compassion. I, you know, I don't, I think we can't underestimate that dynamic. And so there is something for me about the way in which people are recruited into leadership positions. You know, are we talking to them about values and those sorts of, are we using that language from the minute they walk in the door? And I don't think that that's universal yet. And so the work that Richard and Judith and the rest of the groups are doing, we're trying to contribute to the body of knowledge about these universal principles that should be adopted by health. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Francesca, any reflection from you on, on that part? I concur, although in some of the observations that have been made uh, are relevant to you know, the, 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 the delivery level of a particular organization. And my interest is perhaps more at the macro level of yeah. policy, uh, yeah. which is incredibly rigid in many ways. You know, it's mm. with uh, obviously institutions uh, which are set. And for me, there is a wider dimension, for example, uh, Sarah, I think you mentioned training, but isn't there a bigger agenda even of the skills that we, uh, with, with which we train health professionals more broadly, which have been very much oriented towards the knowledge of, uh, you know, the medical knowledge, really the technical, the clinical knowledge, but in a world that is changing in complexity of uh, care environments and care needs, which are changing, probably we need different type of skills for um, mm -hmm making difficult decision making in, uh, in, in the situations where it's not straightforward what the answer is for uh, working collaboratively or handling um, information that might be not clear cuts for you know more of those transversal type of skills and including leadership uh, of course which are not necessarily talks into the main curricula um, mm -hmm. so perhaps there is broader questions about how do we address it at the macro uh, level, the change into, into the system. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nick? I think there's a, there's a very good point in the um, questions, um, which kind of flags the, there's, there's a risk here that we become very theoretical or not based on reality. And of course, all of us, our own individual experience will determine our perception of you know, what leadership looks like to us. So, you know, how compassionate is our individual leader or our hospital or our um, surgery or wherever it is we're based? And it's very much determined by the, 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 the influences and the people we have around us. I think it's, so I think it's important to call out actually what we're looking, looking at and talking about today is the ideal of where we'd want to get to and the direction. But there is also then a sense of reality gap. Uh, and, and that's very much couched around who you are and where you work, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. So, so we have another question here, which I find um, very, very interesting. So how can compassionate leadership, listening leadership be implemented in a high stress environment? And taking into account that we have had a very long high stress environment with, uh, with the COVID crisis, um, 
and this comes a bit back to Francesca's point in the beginning also on, on what do we do when we when we get pushed? Do we go backwards or forwards or do we keep status quo? Um, yeah, uh, does anybody want to take the lead on this one? Well, I think one of the really interesting concepts about um, leadership transformation and it's not it's you know it's not all about training some of that some of what we need to do comes from experiential processes you know in conversation and one of the things that I think has been very important in my own experience and in what we found is the role of peer support within leadership groups so a real kind of strong focus on being able to have frank conversations being able to hold each other to account and so on and so on and so I think that you can't underestimate the um, the way in which the transformation around leadership broadly is coming from lots of different angles. And one of the ways about I found in terms of pushing me forward is having strong peer relationships with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Other reflections on that one, Richard? I might, might just echo home. I think Sarah's absolutely right. Because leading in this way, I, mean, I, I think is really hard. And, and if we're, you know, if we're coming across as a bit, um, starry-eyed or a bit idealistic about it. it it's, it's, I think, because we're passionate about it, but we also recognise that that, it, that it's hard to do. And, and my, in relation to the, the kind of stress um, side of it, I, I, I think I'd add it, it, it. If you don't have enough staff to do the job properly, being a compassionate leader is better than being an uncompassionate leader. Mm -hmm. But if there aren't enough staff to do the job properly, you've got to solve that problem too and and just somehow adopting a different leadership style doesn't make everything um mm -hmm. in, in and of itself all right so it's not the only thing you've got to do to no. get things right but it's really important yes i can yeah. only endorse what's been said bringing in my patient perspective i think however horrible life gets and i've had some experiences of horrible horrible pain or whatever and you just have to hold on to that idea this is i want to stay compassionate you have to hold on to it, whatever happens. And if you've got peers to help you or a leadership structure that helps you, it's it doesn't need very much. You just need to be kept reminded. And of course, that's very, very self-reinforcing because as soon as you can keep those values, it, it will spread and it will support each other and help yourself. You know, so that's I, I totally agree with Sarah and, and Richard. Thank you. And uh, Francesca? But you maybe, can I just one additional observation that yeah. springs to mind? We have sometimes the tendency of thinking, you know, that the quality of the leader and leadership as something that is the individual who is the leader. But in a way, the leadership is really created by uh, the organization as a whole, is created by everybody who works around the leader. So it's not just something which is a, a trait of a personality or you know <laughs> a gift that a person has or that has acquired through, through own experience uh, and and it's something that nobody else can replicate in a way there is a lot that the organization around it needs to do to construct a more collaborative leadership both in terms of the uh, peer supports uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, the skills that can be built, uh, or even in terms of the resilience. I mean, we mentioned the crisis, but you know, the mental health resilience of the team uh, as a whole can help encouraging them more collaborative leadership. So I wonder whether we we need to think at uh, collaborative leadership not as just you know the leader itself, but more really as the uh, the results of the or the way the organization as a as a whole yeah. works and functions. So yeah, so. So it's, it's, it's both a long-term organizational build-up and a long-term educational system cap capability building in that part. Mm, yeah, interesting. Nick? I, I kind of echo Richard's point and, and, and I guess um, Francesca's point about whether um, it's an individual leader or it's a leadership group. And for me, it comes back to role modeling. So particularly, in, we've seen this in COVID in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going to talk about compassionate leadership or collaborative leadership, you know, people who work for you will look to see that demonstrated every day. Um, and, you know, the, if, if, you, if you're not behaving in that way, it kind of falls on stony ground pretty quickly, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is a quite an interesting question here. So do we need to provide examples of bad characteristics of leadership and as well as good leadership in order to get this understanding? 
So, so, so what are bad characteristics? I think we've got quite a lot of examples around that in the world at the moment, don't you? <laughs> we just perhaps need to read a newspaper or go on Twitter. I think there's lots of that. Yeah, but, but is there a point in, in order to, to get this across understanding? Because, um, I mean, we, we can agree on what the good things are. And, and I think one of the nuances here is, is that there might be nuances on how you understand compassionate leadership, because you can't always sit 20 people around the table and use two hours to take a decision, right? And you who work in health systems you know, know that. So, so there are some nuances which probably need to be worked on in order also to get the understanding in, in building this, because we need we need a health system, as, as Francesca was saying, the structural part and the educational part to take this on. So, so how, how do we do this? Francesca, you have a comment? As I mentioned, I think it's, a, it's something that starts by changing even the overarching objectives that we want to achieve. I mean, we talk a lot about the collaboration involving the patients and so forth. Uh, I mean, people who have heard me already speaking in the, in the past, but that will not be new. We have health systems which are not oriented about the well-being and the needs of patients. They are oriented about, about more the, uh, the volumes of services to be delivered. And that's also what we measure and what we are attentive to. Mm -hmm. In a way, you need to turn around the entire conversation, um, the institutions that you have, uh, the way you measure success uh, in order then to have the, the, the change trickle down. And you need to work from uh, uh, the bottom up in making sure that changing systems is changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any... Um... I'm a bit disappointed I can't get five bad traits of leadership from you. I mean, you can, I can get one from each. That's not so difficult before we go to the next section. Can I get can I get all of you just to say the worst trait? You don't have to mention persons. What What is the worst trait you see uh, frequently in leaders? I think a huge issue has been um, the, the lack, uh, destroying trust mm -hmm. by not telling people exactly what what things are sort of hmm. or, 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 or confusion deliberate deception or confusion mm -hmm. I think that's been an incredibly destructive force particularly in the in the pandemic thank you Sarah a lack of insight I mean a, a lack of mm. um, a, an ability to be reflexive and self-critical really uh, I think we've seen a lot of failure is, to do that is that a lack of interest a real genuine interest or a lack of passion? No, I mean, a lack of insight into yourself. So yeah. a lack of, yeah, yeah, so a lack of yeah. ability to know yourself okay. and, you know, what motivates you and why sometimes, you know, you're behaving badly. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Richard? And I would probably say it's something about just being uncaring as a leader of the people you are you are working with and, and a, you know, a focus on a particular result at all costs, regardless of... Uh, of the impact on those you work you work with. Yes, Nick. I would say probably intolerance, um, intolerance of other people's opinions, their views, not prepared to listen to other um, other people, and by nature, therefore, determining that you're right, irrespective of whatever mm -hmm. else is being presented. Thank you, Francesca. Um, maybe the self-interest being having, you know, as a goal and objective, the self, as opposed to the mm. goods of uh, the organization or the institutions or, uh, you know, <laughs> mixing up what is my role oriented towards in a way. Yes, so that's a lack of the collaborative understanding and the common goals. Yeah, good, thanks. We'll now move on to the next session with a launch interview of uh, Nick and Francesca, and we are starting with you, Francesca, if that's okay. You are responsible for, for the OECD work on health, and you have a very good understanding of international health systems and policies. And you often advise leaders on how to, uh, on how to better healthcare. So the question is, um, 
when thinking about a resilient Europe in the next five to 10 years, where do you see the greatest need for collaborative leadership for health and well-being? Yeah, and it's, it's not an easy question, I must say. All these uh, questions about collaborative leadership are not straightforward, but for me, there are three main levels uh, that needs to be addressed. The first one is the, the pure level of collaborative leadership in the sense of the collaboration among leaders, um, which uh, I think we have seen examples in the context of the current pandemics of uh, you know, global collaboration uh, falling apart so in a context in which the crisis is truly a global crisis. Uh, the international collaboration across countries has uh, uh, had some failings or struggled to um, take, take uh, foods. Uh, it took a lot of time, particularly at the beginning of the pandemics, but there are issues that are remaining uh, right now, you know, looking at uh, even things with uh, you know, the working on the supply chains and uh, the availability of uh, essential uh, mask, uh, medical products and equipments and uh, what happening in terms of uh, cross countries, uh, trade restrictions and all sorts of things. Uh, uh, moving on obviously to all the, the questions about uh, <clears throat> how to ensure a more global equitable distributions of, uh, of vaccine and so forth. So I think there is that level of uh, collaborative leadership at the global level that is important to address. Um, I think there is an issue of collaborative leadership that we have probably mentioned quite a lot and uh, you know for the re remarks that we have heard from from the speakers today about how to make um, the leaders work much more collaboratively with communities, but also I would say with the scientific community more broadly, with the, the care professionals, and obviously with the decision maker. And I think for me, uh, a critical issue which is, uh, needs to be worked upon much more is how to um, announce uh, the, 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 the public trust. The public trust makes and facilitate that more uh, open collaboration so they bring together different type of actors uh, uh, into, into the system. And the third type of uh, leadership may be that, um, you know, that it's needed in collaborative leadership is when we look at the working across different sectors. Mm -hmm. um, so think about uh, horizontalities between the health and social care sectors or so think about addressing issues around mental health um, conditions that do require much more integrated approach uh, between the health sector, but also the education sector or the, the, the employment uh, sector. So how do we create a common goals that facilitate that uh, collaborative leadership? Yes. And I guess this comes a bit into uh, to the next question. So which is, uh, we know that effective and cross-sector collaboration does not occur, occur naturally. What will help us meet this or these needs? And if it goes back a little bit to what I was, I was saying, I mean, for me, uh, when looking at collaboration, both within sectors and then across sectors, there are, first of all, some things that relate to structural or institutional issues that need to be addressed. If you, Take, for example, health and social care and the lack of collaborative leadership across mm -hmm. the sector. Often these sectors are governed by different funding streams uh, with different payment mechanisms. Uh, there are different types of incentives, in some cases, even different legal uh, framework that govern that. And it's quite clear that the leadership and the collaborative leadership is much more different if there is no alignment across those institutional uh, mm -hmm. issues, structures. Uh, I think there is an issue of, uh, you know, aligning more also the more at the management and delivery uh, structures around much more commonality of objectives uh, that can achieve uh, even with having more common and shared performance frameworks. Um, the encouragement of uh, interdisciplinary work that can come the uh, what is put at the center is really that the, the, the patient well-being uh, considered as the goal that needs to be achieved and that needs to be rewarded. And obviously, it requires the, the whole issues of uh, creating a more collaborative uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, as well. Yes. But 
quite interesting, you know, when looking across different sectors, and you did mention the health, um, you know, employment uh, and education system uh, coming together. Very often, we don't consider the objectives of, uh, uh, say, you know, having a good health system, uh, a good uh, mental health system being coming from a different sector. So we don't see that employment a person with mental health conditions is considered as, a, as a, an indicator of success of uh, mental health policies. And mm. I think there, is, there needs to be much more commonality and bringing in of, uh, um, of shared objectives across sectors that will facilitate that more collaborative leadership uh, uh, across the sector and ultimately drive them more, more integrated policy approaches, which are quite mm. uh, fundamental to, to address the complexity of health needs. Thanks. And this comes back to one of your comments before on, on the system does what you measure it for, right? So, so and OECD has done extensive work on measuring well-being and societal progress. So the question was actually how leaders can, can best apply this. But, but this is also about, I mean, do we need to, do we need to refigure not just what we measure, but also what we want to use it for in order to really initiate this change that, uh, that you are asking for? That's for sure, and it's uh, it's not a straightforward uh, chain. But there are things that can that can help, and that you know countries have been doing. First, obviously, by thinking, um, even in terms of a conceptual framework that guides uh, you know the notion of of health and well being. You know what mm. exactly do we mean, and is that conceptual framework clear at the the level of the organization you know, at the level of of policy. Um, there is definitely the issues of measurement, and we have done quite a lot of work at OECD with the, the Better Life uh, Index, um, you mm -hmm. know, the, the different dimensions of, uh, of well-being. Mm -hmm. But there is a question of are we uh, embedding into our more regular um, statistical system for measuring success of uh, countries, uh, those more alternative uh, indicators of well-being type of metrics are really used and mm. are they used also to engage citizens in, in, in things that matter to them? So can we use the metrics in ways that they themselves, they, the citizens can see what matters to them, that information that feeds into policy making. Um, mm. And mm. there are the issues that you mentioned, the issues of incentives, which is quite important uh, for a policy maker, but some countries have uh, are experimenting also with things around well-being uh, budgeting uh, tools, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. that can be a, can help to drive, uh, uh, you know, the system to move towards certain uh, type of uh, of objectives. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and and I, I think I think you you half answered my next question on where you want to see this research applied, but I, I can understand that the well-being tools is, is something that you really want to see. I don't know if there are others as well. Uh, well-being is important for us as OECD. We are, in terms of the, the health agenda, we're really trying to push very much the notion, and it has been mentioned by all the speakers, about really putting people at the center of uh, health um, by uh, starting with, with the way we measure you know, success. So are we really measuring whether health systems are making a difference to individuals or not? And not just the individual itself, but also population, so the population mm -hmm. health. Yeah. You know, and from that follows all sorts of uh, ways in which you uh, then organize uh, the system uh, uh, that you have around. Mm -hmm. and, and are there any... Uh good examples of cities and or countries who we should look at as front runners in this as examples on on uh, well-being there, there are a number of uh, quite a large number of countries that have uh, started to to do work on the notion of uh, well-being and also measuring framework um, nearly half of uh, of OECD countries and uh, you know I think about 10 of them that have some specific mechanism for embedding the notion of uh, well-being into mm. into topics within central uh, governmental policy. So there is quite a lot which is being done. There is a lot of talk which is made often about the experience. It's not a European country, it's, uh, it's New Zealand. 
um, which uh, really put the notion of well-being as being uh, at the center of uh, the, their entire, you know, government budget and government uh, uh, policies. Uh, they did set up a, a living standards framework, uh, a dashboard of, the, of indicators that cut across uh, mm -hmm. the entire uh, um, government to really to measure uh, progress. Uh, they have a, a, a well-being budget, uh, which is used then to identify policies uh, and priorities uh, that would, at the central level, really make a difference for individuals. And it could be that for making uh, improvements into health, you need to invest in other uh, parts of the, the health system. So it's really this idea of applying a well-being lens to you know all sorts of policies from health, but also things like uh, housing or uh, immigration policies. So New Zealand is really very much uh, look at as an example, but there are um, indicators uh, of well-being and the budgeting which are used in other countries as well, in France, in, uh, in the budget law a few years ago, uh, mm. there were you know, indicators of well-being. Um, the, the same was applied in, a, in, a, in Italy with uh, uh, measures of uh, progress uh, and with uh, you know also reporting and for forecasting around uh, well-being uh, i think sweden some of the nordic countries sweden with uh, with a framework again from uh, uh, mm. measuring the support thing so it's it starts to be something that um that many many different countries are talked about uh, obviously the implementation is not straightforward mm. because the difficulty in, uh, in many countries is that uh, functioning pipeline ministers. So even if you try to, you know, make sure and bring together a notion which is more uh, about the the, the the wealth and the health uh, of uh, societies as a, as a whole, you then have uh, often uh, still ministries which are organized by, uh, you know, at, mm. uh, at their own level, and mm. sometimes very difficult to, to break those uh, ceilings and, and barriers, even if you have tools such as, you know, well-being budgeting, which, uh, which help to uh, mm. convey um, the and uh, center all the efforts uh, around uh, more common goals. Thank you. So we will come back with uh, questions for you also after Nick. So you have given us a very good ecosystem perspective. And Nick, you uh, you can help us dig deeper into how individual organizations are leading health and well-being from within. So you joined John Lewis Partnership, and when you did, did so, you were given a unique task, I've understood, to redesign and create a workplace health service. And you did that, so so you acted on it. So later on this initiative, uh, later on this initiative evolved, and you created an integrated health and well-being service. So tell us a bit more about that. What were you able to achieve with the health and well-being service? So, yeah. Hi, Berger. Yeah, thanks. Um, so for those that don't know, um, I work for John Lewis Partnership, and that that's um, we're retailers. So we sell um, food through our Waitrose um, shops and um, non-food items through John Lewis. Um, department stores and online. Um, we're we're about eighty thousand um, partners, as we call them. The partnership the partnership is actually a co-owned business, the largest in the UK. So we all own a little slice of the business. So we don't have shareholders in the true sense. Um, we turn over about eleven billion pounds a year. Um, we've got ninety million customers. So we're quite a big organisation. Um, Health services were first introduced into the partnership when it when it became a, um, a co-owned business in 1929, um, and and for nothing more than at that time there wasn't a national health service, um, and people couldn't afford to actually pay for medical treatment or consultations, uh, and obviously our services have changed over the years since. Um, when I um, when I joined the partnership ten years ago, I was asked to redesign or look at um, what we were doing because it was disjointed and become quite unclear. Uh, and we've created something which is very much outcomes focused. Um, and so it's been interesting listening to the talk today about what drives change, because often it's growth or crises in my experience. And, and actually, if you're in a period of um, kind of even keel and everything's kind of floating along quite nice, nicely, there's no kind of imperative to do any of those things. Um, so we, we have uh, an in-house occupational health service. Uh, which um, comprises 25 um, nurses 
Um, we have uh, an outsourced physiotherapy and mental health service, which provides uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling free of charge to all our employees uh, that need it. Uh, and we have an, uh, um, an internal uh, team of wellbeing practitioners that um, respond and deal with uh, 40,000 calls a year. And that's around everything from bereavement, emotional um, uh, aspects of people's lives, like relationship breakdowns, through to financial assistance and support. And what struck us is that when you start to look at what we're delivering, we get some really great outcomes in musculoskeletal and for mental health in terms of clinical improvements from the treatment. When you start to look at the causes, there's an interrelationship between some of the other aspects of what we, um, what we already um, support. And that's not surprising because as people, we all know, you know, if we go through a marriage breakdown or a relationship ends, um, you know, that's, that can be traumatic. It can lead to financial problems. It can lead to a whole range of other relationship issues. Uh, but we found it was the primary driver for the reason we were treating people for depression at work. And you kind of go, well, well, what's that got to do with an employer? Well, if people are depressed, you know, in many cases, they won't come to work. If they do come to work, you know, their concentration, uh, their ability to be productive is, is severely impaired. Um, and coming back to the compassion a bit, you know, why wouldn't you want to help someone that's got depression? Um, so we've brought those two teams together, but with a third aspect, which is our, um, which is our leisure team. Um, our, our founder back in 1929 believed that actually um, social well-being um, and, and the culture, the arts, sport, activities, uh, music and the like um, played a really uh, important role in enriching people's lives and giving them some balance. And we invest significantly in that. We've brought all three of those teams um, together. Uh, we think about well-being in terms of um, not just social well-being, physical, mental well-being, but also you know, the financial, um, emotional um, aspects as well. And we're doing some work at the moment to link that to just individual, not just individual, but organisational purpose as well. And, and what we're trying to do is create a holistic approach. So actually get to the aspects of people's lives proactively where positive psychology or relationship advice and guidance before it gets to a place of relationship breakdown which leads to depression um you know we try and stop that cycle before it's happening early days um but um we're encouraged and i think i think where it comes from is actually being outcome focused and being clear on what you're trying to measure um the pandemic of course has got in the way of some of that um, not least the social because of um, you know, the restrictions on being able to meet um, and do things that we would have done in last year and this half of this year in previous times. I'm going to stop at that point because it gives you a chance to, to delve deeper and, and um, I may have said too much. So, um, you know. So, um, and, and actually uh, quite impressive and, and, and prevention in, 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 in a way, uh, which is quite deep. So, and, and the next question was, uh, was also on, on the social contract with the staff that you have. How was that affected by, by COVID-19, which changes a lot of things? It, it does. And I think what it's changed more than anything else is expectations. Um, so, um, you know, in the business that I've just described, we had lots of different people in different circumstances. So our, our food supermarket, Waitrose, um, traded throughout. So our partners were expected to go to work to serve customers at the risk of catching COVID. Mm -hmm. Lorry drivers were delivering to shops and home deliveries. And yet our other shops were all closed. Our head office workers were sent and were working from home. We had mm -hmm. some people that were furloughed. I know that's not necessarily a scheme unique um, to the UK, but we had some that were effectively being paid to stay at home where others were expected to go to work and be paid. So it was, it was a very different experience and, and quite divisive in some respects because the risks being taken you know, uh, weren't the same, weren't shared. Mm -hmm. I think as we've come through it, I think what's what's changed, um, we're moving to a blended working for our head office, um, our mm -hmm. partners. Uh, people won't expect and want more choice. Mm -hmm. um, I think they want more flexibility. Um, they definitely want less commuting, yeah. but it depends who you are. And if you look at some of our younger partners who maybe live with friends, four or five of them sharing a flat, they don't necessarily have a good office space or a desk space or bandwidth on their um, Wi-Fi that actually will enable them to work. And they've been quite keen to come back to the office because they're missing the social interaction. So again, 
as people, we will want different things. And, and parents with schools that were closed, you know, we're glad to see the children go back to school um, or be able to get away from, you know, homeschooling. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the expectations have changed. Um, and I mm -hmm. think un underlying all of that, I think our partners want to see a business and an organisation that cares for them and it's seen to care for them and, and, and go the extra mile, um, you know, to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And just to the audience, we... Uh... We would still really like to have your reactions come again as well. So we will take that in, in a few minutes. So um, so I think, I mean, this comes also back to what the question to Francesca was. So, so um, I mean, does this go upwards or downwards on, on the organizational S-curve? So, so, I mean, can, can we make something, uh, the changes that, that will come, can we make them positive? Yeah, yes, I think so. I think... I, once the cork is out of the bottle, the genie's out. I think you can't put it back in. I think um, you know people have tasted different aspects of working lives forced upon them, forced upon you know our business. Um, but actually, there's bits to that which they like, and there's bits that they've kind of realised that they don't. And I think some of that will translate into people deciding to do different things. But I think it also brings a greater focus on health and well-being in the workplace. Um, so whether you work in the care sector or or another sector. You know, I'm lucky enough to lead a, a you know a, a, a corporate health team, um, but actually other parts of our business, you know, the same thing is true. And I think I think health and well-being has become a board level issue when perhaps it wasn't always yes. considered that. I think that will lead in time. Mm -hmm. um, already discussions. I was on another call this morning to corporate reporting. Mm -hmm. um, how does this fit with the eth ethics and sustainability agenda? How does this fit with, um, you know, a whole range of other things that are interrelated? Because actually our people's health drives productivity of organisations. It drives our ability to support healthcare mm -hmm. systems and deliver care um, mm -hmm. at the point it's needed. So I, I think it's done very positive things that out of a crisis, I think we'll see a very positive uplift in terms of people's appreciation and investment and um, where it sits on the corporate agenda. So for me, it's a good thing. Thanks. Uh, very interesting. So, so just a a question where you say yes or no, both of you, before we go to audience questions, will we have a head of well-being uh, as a role in every organization? Every, I mean, almost every. Hope so. Yes. Having been, I, I am the head of well-being. So yes, I would. Yeah. Say, yeah. You can. You can have a head of well-being, or you can have a. A well-being function, you know. Uh, I guess there can be different way of structuring that, you know. But mm. Uh, mm. but definitely there is some realization that that's very important. Although it's as much as the pandemics as as uh, as Nick you were saying, um, there is huge focus and attention on health and well-being, including in discussions at the highest uh, political leaders level. Health as an investment is being recognized mm -hmm. in the G20. Uh, communicate and, and, and support. I mean, the big question will be, will this remain? Uh, mm -hmm. And how do we continue to make sure that this uh, prioritization, focus and attention uh, remains even beyond uh, the, the current crisis moment, particularly as countries will start to realize that there are also huge debts to be paid off and how do we secure that there is still this uh, attention mm -hmm. to health mm -hmm. and well-being that remains front and center. So, so if I am, uh, let me just be a little bit black and white. So, so in, in we, I think all three of us agree on that public health is extremely important, but also to take care of the individual in that one. And uh, health and all policies has been flagged for decades, but now we're actually seeing companies having that on their, so to say, scoreboard to the board. But we are not really seeing governments to a large uh, enough extent. So, so... Is it that we need to have the company leaders to tell the governments to get their act together and push this? I think it'd be helpful because you get what you measure. And if you don't measure it, you're probably not going to aim for it. Um, I th I th it's a bit like the previous answer, uh, Bogey. If, if I'm honest, the answer is probably no, not yes, because mm -hmm. actually 90% of the people, in, in, certainly in the UK, work in small organisations and therefore wouldn't yeah. have... So 
for larger organizations yes for governments should that be the case yes and and certainly you know from some of the um the national forums and things i, I sit on and talk to other colleagues i think there is is far more um, understanding and, and interest at government level in, in terms of the impact and i think if you know the, the pandemic has done it's done that if nothing else because actually you know it's it's crippled society really in, in every respect mm. so let's hope so fingers crossed and just any thoughts from you on that I agree, mean, but it's, uh, I guess, I mean, you can say help in all, you could also say uh, environment in whole. I think there are yeah. an issue of understanding what are the fundamental yeah. things that you need for the future of our societies yeah. and civilizations as well. And yes. then, you know, making sure that work, we need to have the whole set of working to ensure a mm. sustainable, uh, you know, uh, environment yeah. and addressing the climate change. So as much as we need, you know, any other sector to make sure that their employees, the workers or the mm. the mm. customers that they serve are in good health. And um, I think that's, you know, again, like moving beyond the, I'm looking just at my own uh, objective or yeah. my own, I don't know, company, my own sector, yes. uh, and you know, needs to be challenged. And the pandemic has challenged it in, in, any, yes. in this way, as much as we see growing awareness of the uh, the environmental, you know, um, catastrophe that is looming um, in front of us. And let's go to some of the audience questions. So I, I was also in, in another long, uh, several sessions this morning where, where the patient activity, patient integration, partnership with patient was flagged very high. So here's a question to you, Francesca. Uh, what are the OCD thoughts on how to better use patient reported outcomes? Well, you know, as, as you know, that's something that we have been uh, working on a to try before on using <laughs> to measure. I mean, it's, it's mm. a, there's mm. very little that we know um, about patient reported outcomes and experiences. So it's extraordinary how within health systems, uh, you know, we're unable to say whether a certain procedure a certain act make a difference, or we are unable to say why country X has uh, three times as many procedures, uh, all things being equal, even adjusted by uh, uh, things such as um, uh, different demographics and, uh, and, and uh, level of, uh, of risk. So before saying, you know, how we use it, so I think we need to start measuring, and that's what we've been trying to, to push mm. uh, very much the agenda for, really to, to change, you know, that what we, we consider a successful health system is not how much you spend, it's not the volumes of services that you deliver, but it's ultimately the well-being and the, you know, how you're able to make a difference to uh, the people that are served by the health system. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nick, there's a question for you. How can we address and improve the stigmatization of mental health disease in the workplace? How can we improve it? No, not uh, yeah. So not so less stigmatization. Sorry, no, less, less stigmatization. I think I think it comes from um, shouting from the roofs. I think it comes from the leadership. I think it comes from um, in terms of the very top, the, the executive team, the chief executive, whatever organizational structure you've got. But I think it comes then from providing uh, people to talk openly about their experiences and share. Um, mm -hmm where they've come from. We, we use, um, without a prompt, there are other good social business media uh, things around. We use Google communities as a, as a tool prolifically around the business. So we have, for example, a network of partners um, focused around ability. It's called the Ability Group um, as opposed to disability, but it includes mental health along with a range of other things. And those is partner led. Um, and they speak around uh, daily, there's posts and people post self-help and other types of information but we um we use um our chief executive for one of better our chairman vlogs on mental health we'll promote around world mental health day um we've got a positive psychology tool we make freely available to everyone so we've got eleven thousand partners that use that regularly and mind um we will in october run a campaign to recruit more partners to try it um, we gather a kind of a pre-use um, on their sentiments around how they're feeling, around a whole range of things around their happiness, fulfillment, relationship, mm -hmm. sleep and the like. And then over time, we'll look at the acquired learning and see what difference that makes. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly, we've tracked that through COVID. And apart from a two month, month drop in March and uh, April last year, um, the kind of part of sentiment banks back up to what it was pre-COVID by May last year. So it was mm. kind of it dipped a little bit in November when we had a bit of another second lockdown. Um, mm. So it's been quite interesting because actually whilst that's not everybody, it is an indication of, you know, people do get into a kind of a rhythm and an even keel, even as they adapt to the circumstances yeah. around them. Um, mm. But I think all you can do is talk about it, talk about it and talk about it more. And it becomes less of an issue um i hope that's answered the question yes you did you did so uh and and i have another question which i would like you to be very brief on because i have an, a last one for both of you before uh, we go on to the next session so there is a question here on uh that many companies and leaders would be interesting to to understand the return of investment of what you're doing so, so yeah, 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 no, no. So I'll, I'll be really quick. Some of it you can't measure. So some of it is just a leap of faith. Um, mm -hmm. So we provide an awful lot of investment in social activities. Uh, we've got, you know, 13,000 of our partners belong to a club, one of 23 clubs, and enjoy spending time with each other doing something they love. We don't know what the return on investment is, but they love it. It gives us social cohesion networks that we wouldn't get otherwise. Where we do know is things around providing free physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. Um we save uh, we save something like seven million pounds a year, sixty thousand working days, by providing that free of charge through productivity improvement and through reduction in absence. Um, and you know, likewise with mental health, we know it's five times cheaper for us to treat people while they're still able to work than see them go off long term and and take some difficult steps to get back to work. So um, it does exist; it is possible. Um, not just for the right thing to do. Yes, thank you. It's the right thing, it's the leap of faith, and, and then there's some economics. Yeah. Probably in that order. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then a last question for both of you. Um, so there are a lot of leaders who value and care about staff well-being. But what challenges do you think they face when it comes to delivering on that vision and how can it be overcome? And I can only give you one minute each. So please, uh, Francesca. In terms of leaders, sorry, I, I missed part of your question. Yeah, so leaders value and care about staff well-being, but what challenges do you think they face when it comes to delivering on that vision? And how can that be overcome? Uh, multiple uh, challenges. I mean, time, uh, you know, obviously there is a tendency to say, oh my God, there is so much I have to do that somehow one forgets that having the well-being of the staff will probably be uh, the way to save your own time. So, you know, like the clarity about uh, how achieving, you know, well-being will help achieving all sorts of other objectives. I think that's, uh, that's something that needs to be remade. But, um, you know, perhaps some of the challenges that uh, leaders face are things which are in reality not challenged. If one turns around the lens and thinks more not in terms of tasks to be delivered, but uh, in terms of well-being to be achieved for for staff and for um, the organizational uh, clients as a whole. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nick? Um, I, think, um, I think the biggest challenge is that each individual, each one of us is responsible for our own health and well-being, and, and we may choose to engage in, in managing that or not. And so for a leader or an organization, it's, you're kind of left with what, what can you influence? And so I think that comes back to you can, but I think that's around education. It's about providing good information. It's promoting. It's, it's providing easy opportunities. Um, it's about providing choice, creating a culture where actually that's the norm and encouraged rather than the exception. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, really a pleasure to have you on here. And thank you for your discipline because we are on the minute where we should be. So... <laughs> I really, really appreciate that. Uh, very good points here. And um, can I then call uh, Richard, Judith, and Sarah back? So thank you. Um, and to to Richard, uh, Judith, and Sarah, um, what is the call to action to other leaders that are in the audience or to everybody in the audience? What is it? Shall I have a go? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think Nick said it probably in, in the sense that kind of why wouldn't we want to care for the people we're working with? 
um, you know, because it, <laughs> to say because it's just the right thing to do might sound a bit feeble, um, but because it is just the right thing to do, um, along with actually, I think you're hearing an in increasingly large number of examples of organisations who have tried this and who see it, that it helps them deliver their purpose too. So, you know, it is the right thing to do. And actually, I think that's what matters most, but it does seem to work um, if you stick at it over time and, and, and build something sustainable. Mm, very good. Judith? So it's been fascinating hearing these different viewers. And if I bring in the patient perspective again, as a patient, you endure illness, discomfort, uncertainty. I've built long-term relationships with health professionals that help me manage my conditions. And I would really like to support health systems uh, because it would, it would benefit me. And often I and other patients feel like the, the object of interest, but, but not really part of the system where outliers and I think Francesca brought up a lot of very important points about about the, the measurement of success in a health system should be oriented towards patient benefit or the patient patient outcome this is I mean why wouldn't you want to make the highest measure of success in the health system the patient outcome um, so so I'm very much in favor of shared decision making and, and patient outcomes because if, if only I and other citizens could trust the health system more and, and feel more associated with it, we, we want to be part of the solution. We, we have something to give through our lived experience and our knowledge of the health system 24 um, seven. And, uh, and that, would, that would, would, you know, the health system would benefit. And I think the leaders that we've been studying in our, in our Siena program have shown the value of empowering patients uh, they're going down a path that will lead to a more resilient, a more sustainable and a, and a better health system. Mm. I think if, you, if you look at the COVID response in Europe, um, I think we probably agree it could have been better and that we are learning the benefits of, or we're learning that we can't beat a pandemic without the collaboration of citizens. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems was, I've possibly, is that in the crisis, the kind of instinct was to default back to the tried and test methods of top-down uh, command and control. And that is the opposite of collaborative leadership. So I'm for more collaborative leadership. Thanks. One, one of the things I often say when I'm having discussions is person first, jurisdiction next. Maybe that's, that's the point yeah. going forward. Sarah? I mean, I think there's something for me that's come out here that, that not much of this is at all possible if we don't have that critical analysis of oneself. So I just really want to draw on that perspective of reflexivity, not just being reflective, but really that kind of critical analysis of yourself and your systems, because I think it's not just about imagining that an individual can be compassionate or resilient, but that, that you need to have that reflected in your organizational system as well. But you also have to interrogate your own reasons for being there, for being in your role. Is it self-serving? Is it really about, you know, being engaged in communities and offering hope and inspiration? If, you know, you really do need to interrogate all of those because I think over the coming years, they are going to be challenged at a level we've probably never been challenged before, even at the height of the pandemic. So, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you uh, very much. And, and I would like you, uh, both you three, and also Nick and Francesca, to, uh, I will just wrap a bit off, but I will ask you to end off with a one line call to action. I think you were, you were more taking the take home messages, which was the next questions, but you already did that. So, so let's take a one-line call to action from all five of you uh, in, in a minute or two. So if you can think, maybe maybe it's better to do it spontaneous, but now you have to think. Uh, and um, I, would, I would like to thank the, the audience, but also you for, for very good dynamic insights and also to bridge this thing on, on what, I mean, there is the organizational and this the personal, and it is the organization that makes the person and, and the other way around and to be much more, alert on on these things uh, and and i also i also really uh, i really do appreciate this this discussion on what is it we will need going forward not just what is it we we need now um and and of course uh, as as judith was was saying if it's not about the patient outcome then what is it uh, what is it we want to do but 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 nevertheless the well-being aspect is also to where possible 
to avoid a lot of people becoming patients. It's not possible in all cases, but it's possible in some cases. So how how do we how do we get this in? So so uh, so so how uh, and the cross silos is inside the same health institution. It's between health institution. It's between jurisdiction in countries. It's between countries, and it's definitely between disciplines. So so how how do we? Also revisit uh, that. So, so if uh, can we just get the pizza? Not because I'm hungry. I just to revisit if we have had any changes in the pizza since we, since we were there. Um, if that's possible to get that back on the screen. So, uh, and did we have the results? I think that was what, what I what I hoped for. But about yeah. Okay, so inclusive and democratic came came clearly on top here and emotional. Okay, so so just to take home for you that um, of course all of these silo buster is is on, on the bottom. So I think my conclusion it might be jumping to a conclusion is that probably you need the other things in order to bust the silos. That could be a way to say it. Thank you. Can we take away that screen again? So um, now you're in the hotspot. So uh, Nick and, and Francesca, can I get your cameras on again? Please. So um, is there a volunteer to go first? The one line call to action. I, I'm pretty sure that Judith wants to go first, so she does. How do you know that? OK, so you, you get more buy-in from citizens if you empower them and enable them to help improve the system. Thank you. Francesca? Well, I guess uh, there's a window of opportunity. Take your chance to improve the system now. Thank you. Uh, Richard? So I'll go big picture. I think the really big challenges, environmental sustainability, tackling inequalities, integrating health and care, need us to be collaborative and need us to be compassionate if we're going to get anywhere near tackling them. Thanks, Sarah. I think it's for me, it's about don't try to colonize our social movements. Instead, embrace, think with them, work alongside. But yes, don't colonize. Don't colonize. Okay. Nick? Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's really simple. I suppose collaboration is not optional. So you can't do it on your own. Very good. Okay. And you in the audience, you got. Um, Five words of wisdom. If you didn't write them down, I think we will send it to you on the email so, so you can have that with you. I hope you have uh, enjoyed this session. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for both uh, the questions we got and, and for the interaction we had here. And, and thank you to, um, to the Gastein. Uh, I really think it's an important uh, thing to have this focus on health uh, yearly and doing this online uh, in this way. Thank you very much for that. And of course, a huge thank to the Skiana uh, network and, and the vision and the aspiration with Skiana on pushing this agenda and hopefully uh, helping, uh, if, if not all leaders at the same time, uh, one leader step by step, a, by, a bit of the time. And, and let's take this to be a step forward. And, and uh, Nick, I, I think I will just... Uh, copy your, your three lines. I think I will put that on my social media. The right thing to do, the leap of faith, and then think about the business case. That was my version of it. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hope to see you soon somewhere.